let no one who wishes to receive agreeable impressions of American manners commence their travels in a Mississippi steamboat. Francis Trollope, Domestic Manners of the Americans. Steamboats and Streamboats. On August 26, 1791, Thomas Jefferson, head of the U.S. Patent Board, awarded John Fitch, James Rumsey, Nathan Reed, and John Stevens patents associated with inventing various steamboat technologies. All had desired a patent on the entire steamboat. Solomonically dividing the patent spoils kept any from dominating the market or developing a large enough market to succeed. The idea of automating water travel was not original. A century in advance of the market, in 1696, Thomas Savory applied for a patent for rowing ships using paddle wheels and a capstan, but this was dismissed following a negative report from the UK Admiralty. Before steamboats, floating from Pittsburgh to New Orleans took four to six weeks and four months to walk back. The idea of applying steam to solve transport problems was in the air. Benjamin Franklin was interested in the subject, but discouraged paddle wheels in favor of jet propulsion in 1785, a bit ahead of the technology, sending Fitch and Rumsey down an unsuccessful technology path. John Fitch began out of Philadelphia on the Delaware, James Rumsey out of Western Virginia, now West Virginia, on the Potomac. Rumsey obtained support from Franklin and went, met with Matthew Bolton and James Watt. Other inventors and their rivers included Isaac Briggs and William Longstreet in Savannah, who were issued a 1788 patent by the state of Georgia, as well as Oliver Evans on the Delaware, Samuel Morey on the Connecticut, Nicholas Roosevelt on the Ohio and Mississippi, and John Stevens in Hoboken. John Fitch, 1743 to 1798, with partner and rival for the affections of his wife, Henry Voigt, developed a steamboat, the Perseverance, that plied the Delaware River beginning in 1787 using steam-powered oars. After a few years in Philadelphia, he decided to move to France, where he also obtained a monopoly. Finding the reign of terror in full force, he moved to England and then Kentucky, aiming to serve the Ohio River market, seeking fortune before his death. George Washington's Potomac Company hired James Rumsey, 1743 to 1792, as a manager, and he set to develop a steamboat to solve river navigation problems. Rumsey at the time was in the unique position being able both to modify the boat to run on the river and to modify the river to better accommodate the boats. He fell out with Washington over money and in December 1787 demonstrated his steamboat on the Potomac in Shepherdstown. His innovation was a form of jet propulsion. Rumsey acquired some patents in England after moving there in 1788. His admirers formed the Rumseyan Society to help fund his work. The UK had a parallel though related set of developments. Funded by Lord Dundas, who was a major backer of the Clyde and Firth Canal in Scotland, William Symington, 1763 to 1831, constructed the Charlotte Dundas in 1803 for use as a canal tugboat. It could pull two 70-ton barges 32 kilometers, 20 miles, at 5.3 kilometers per hour. We know little about Symington. He had built some stationary engines in at least one unsuccessful tugboat prior to the Charlotte Dundas, and by 1801 had taken out patents on the use of cross-headed slide bars to control piston movement and a horizontal cylinder producing rotary motion. Symington used a double-acting engine and a single 10-horsepower paddle wheel was set within the stern of the boat in order to minimize generation of waves that would damage the canal bank. The knowledge that had been developed about water wheels was directly applicable to boats. The Charlotte Dundas was used on the Firth and Clyde Canal for a year or so and then converted to a dredge. It seems to have been successful, but not successful enough to drive widespread adoption. It came close. The Duke of Bridgewater ordered a number of boats from Symington for use on his canals, but Bridgewater died in 1803 and the order was withdrawn. No other orders came along, and Symington drops out of our story. Robert Fulton, 1765 to 1815, is recognized in the United States as the innovator of the steamboat. The son of a farmer in the Philadelphia area, Fulton was largely self-educated and early in life showed talent as a painter. This took him to Europe in the 1790s, first London where he studied with the American painter Benjamin West and met James Rumsey. He had some funds from his painting and moved in society with those who were stylish and good at conversation and who visited on country home social circuits. Innovation, industry, and commerce were much discussed, and the Fulton's peer group extended beyond the landed gentry. He also met with the Duke of Bridgewater and, while in France, lived with poet diplomat Joel Barlow and his wife Ruth. He introduced steamboat service on the Hudson River in 1807, and he and that date are associated with the beginning of the steamboat era. Fulton's application was not so advanced as Symington's. Fulton used a Watt Bolton engine, side paddle wheels, 
and a rather complex arrangement to obtain rotary motion. Fulton's steamboat also used sails. The engine was neither fuel efficient nor powerful. Even so, he found the market for passengers and finding the market as part of the innovation puzzle. Robert Fulton did not invent the steamboat. He did not even get funded until the original steamboat patents of 1791 expired. Fulton made it excess with financial partner Robert Livingston, who together obtained a 20-year navigation monopoly on the Hudson River, a better market than the Delaware. Fulton knew that navigation monopolies were better than patents, although his particular navigation monopolies were later thrown out by the U.S. Supreme Court as unconstitutional because only the federal government could regulate interstate commerce, which travel on the Hudson River was, and by the 1830s there were more than 100 steamboats on the Hudson, including ones owned by Cornelius Vanderbilt. The steamboat could not have occurred without the steam engine, and of course, would have been irrelevant without inland waterways and canals. One point two, the steam engine. Christian Huygens, a Dutch mathematician, experimented with piston engines using gunpowder to create a vacuum and drive water pumps at a garden in Versailles. Later, steam was condensed to move the piston. In 1679, his Huguenot exile student, Denis Papin, built a steam digester which extracted fats from bones. The bones were then ground into bone meal. He continued work on what is credited as the first steam engine, but it was never practical. In 1696, Thomas Savory patented a steam engine, which he described in his book, The Miner's Friend, or An Engine to Raise Water by Fire, that was aimed at draining waters from mines. While not technologically successful, the patent proved valuable. Thomas Newcomen, a blacksmith, and his partner John Cawley, a plumber, did develop a practical engine about 1704, which was marketed under Savory's patent. The Newcomen engine began to be used in tin, copper, and lead mines in 1712. Coal mine use came later. The exact linkage between Newcomb and Papin is not clear, but Reed argues Newcomb and discussed the matter with Dr. Robert Hooke, who was well aware of Papin's work. You can see elements of Papin's engine inside Newcomb's larger device. The path between science and technology was two-way, each learning from the other. Newcomb's engine worked this way. Rigged to a weight, the piston rested at the top of the cylinder. Steam from a boiler could then be introduced into the cylinder and then cooled by a water spray. The resulting vacuum would pull the piston down. The introduction of steam then breaks the vacuum and the piston returns to its rest position until reintroduced steam is cooled by the reintroduction of water. This was a low steam pressure atmospheric engine. Steam pressure was not sufficient to push the piston upward. Atmospheric pressure pushed the piston down. Automatic control was one key to Newcomen's success. Control of water and steam was automatic. In a centrifugal governor controlled velocity. Such governors had long been used on windmills. John Smeaton seems to have been the first engineer to consider improvements in Newcomen's steam engine. About 1770, he examined a number of engines in their efficiency. The engines used more steam than was required to fill the cylinder, and Smeaton reasoned that this was because the water cooled the wall of the cylinder and that three-fourths of the steam was wasted in reheating the wall. Using analysis, he developed some differing geometric shapes for the boiler and the cylinder, and these had the potential of being more than twice as efficient as the Newcomen design. Smeaton was England's first engineer analyst. Trained as an instrument maker, he became interested in larger scale engineering and studied engineering works on the continent. His first major commission was the lighthouse on Eddystone Rock near Plymouth. To solve the problem of a cement that would harden despite being flooded by tides, he engaged in careful experimentation and measurement and developed a successful hydraulic cement, the first since Roman times. This was an example of rational analysis, and Smeaton applied similar analysis to water wheels and other topics of current interest. Smeaton had studied Newton's Principia in 1687 and engaged in careful measurement and comparison of theory and reality. He wrote extensively and was in contact with like workers on the continent. Though the model provided by his work and his writing, he stimulated rational analysis. One result was the founding of the Society of Civil Engineers in 1771 and early members were referred to as Smithsonian's. Smeaton and his associates provided the know-how for the extensive civil engineering works of the times. James Watt also began his career as an instrument maker. And like Smeaton, he became interested in the steam engine and measured the excessive steam consumption because of the wall heating requirement. In 1765, Watt had the idea of a separate condenser, that is, a condenser was attached to the cylinder and kept cool. 
access to the condenser was blocked off as steam filled the cylinder and opened when the cylinder was full. The steam then condensed in the condenser, providing the vacuum for the downstroke of the piston in the cylinder. The condenser concept was patented in 1769, and in 1774, Watt entered into an agreement with Matthew Bolton, a Birmingham businessman, for the construction of Watt Bolton engines. The factory constructed some engines, it provided designs and erection assistance to others, and payment was received via royalty for the use of the condenser. The mine pumping market for the engine was growing, and extensive developments in other sectors were important. It is of interest that pumps began to be used in urban water supply projects. The factory market used rotational power from water wheels, and to extend his engine to that market, Watt began to work on what would now be called the kinematics of machinery. He developed flywheels and sun and planet gears to transform the reciprocating motion of the piston to rotary motion. He also developed other kinematic devices, and he protected all of his inventions by patents. Watt's developments mooted Smeaton's work with the steam engine. Watt, Smeaton, and other engineers were by this time in touch with the developments on the continent, and there seems to have been a good bit of two-way information exchange, an exchange to and from engine and construction engineering, and within factory engineering. Society changed greatly within the sweep of time we are viewing. Factory development, corn laws, and closure, the American and French revolutions, all were causes and reflections of those changes. Smeaton's ideas of civil engineering drew attention to the social impacts of and the social ser services engineering might provide, and the developing cadre of engineers responded. Watt was regarded as somewhat of a political radical, and some engineers worked on designs for workers' housing and fireproof factories. A few were engaged in the debate over child labor laws. Watt's radical political leanings died from disappointment with the French Revolution. Watt and Smeaton had similar backgrounds. Both were instrument makers and capable of careful measurements. Later, both paid very careful attention to details. Smeaton wished to spin off his style of work, ideas, and knowledge. Watt wanted to protect his. He protected his intellectual property with patents, even if he had no plans to use the ideas. For instance, he patented the double-acting engine in 1782, but never used the idea, nor did he plan to. Watt had protected himself with many patents, as mentioned, and to the extent he could, he extended that protection by obtaining new patents or minor changes in old ones. Even so, patents began to run out at about 1800, opening opportunities for other innovators. By that time, the Watt Bolton engine was widely used on the continent. Indeed, as early as 1735, there were precursor Newcomen engines in Sweden, the mining districts of the Austrian Empire, and at Liege near Brussels. Hands-on knowledge of the engine was widely dispersed, so many had the opportunity to try new ideas. Watt seems not to have been much interested in transportation, and the engine he marketed was so heavily relative to its output that applications were limited. Early trials in road vehicles were attempted, but the first lasting applications were in the water mode and at docks where steam engines pumped water for the operation of pneumatic systems. Stationary steam engines were also used to pump water to the heads of lock systems during periods of low water. One point three Bridgewater. The beginning of England's canal era was marked by the twelve kilometer canal of Francis Egerton, third Duke of Bridgewater. Built by James Brindley, it connected coal mines on the Bridgewater estate at Worsley to Manchester. Construction began in seventeen fifty nine and the canal opened six years later. This was not a construction first. There had long been experience on the continent, and some canals had been built previously in Ireland and England. Bridgewater's canal had some interesting technological features. It tied into his mine drainage scheme, and the boats ran into the mine for loading. Although the canal could accommodate larger boats, the within-mine operations kept the beam of the boats to about 2.1 meters. They were 15 meters long. In order to hold water, the canal was lined with puddled clay, and to avoid extensive lock construction, an aqueduct was constructed over the river Irwell. Bridgewater's canal caught the imagination of the public. It was a financial success, so it also caught the imagination of developers and investors. The result was a flurry of inland navigation acts between 1759 and 1794. Most of these were narrow canals using boats the same width as on Bridgewater's Canal. Adoption of the standardized 2.1 meter boat width kept construction costs down and saved water, a problem for many canals. Bridgewater quickly built a canal connecting Manchester to the coast. There had been starts before and much later a ship canal was built. Boats ran 21 meters 
in length, could carry about 30 tons and were hauled by a horse walking along the side. Canal building yielded valuable experience with earth moving lock structures, bridges, aqueducts, and tunnels, as well as other civil engineering tasks. Construction activities were institutionalized and navigators became navvies. Although navigation acts were private acts, the policy institutional aspects of canal building began to fall into a pattern. Canal companies were organized and issued stock. Rights of use carried over from roads and acts began to require that anyone could operate a boat if tolls were paid. This was not the case for Bridgewater's Canal. Companies such as Pickford's emerged to offer canal plus pickup and delivery service. Canals themselves had predecessor models. Well before canals for moving water for transportation became common, water itself was transported through artificial pipes and open channels. London's New River was established by a company aiming to supply fresh water to London, and it was financed in part by adventurers, those who we would today call venture capitalists, in the various kings. Open in 1613, it was ultimately municipalized in 1904 when it was acquired by the Metropolitan Water Board. It took some time for the project to find its customers, so it needed ongoing private and public subsidy for many years. Of course, it also provided public benefits. Aside from clean drinking water compared with the cholera-inducing wells, which were susceptible to contamination from feces, water could be used to fight fires, and so on. Canals also learned from experience improving rivers. While steam engines were pumping water from coal mines, new means were needed to move coal and other commodities from mines to markets. On account of tides, wet dock construction was needed. A good bit of organization, construction, and financing experience accumulated in response. The low value of many of the commodities moved and the high costs of land transportation urged movement of barges as far inland on the rivers as practical. River navigation posed some physical difficulties large tides, low water levels during some seasons, dredging needs, use conflicts developed. Mill operators had dams and resisted releasing water for navigation. Owners with riparian rights claimed tolls for improvements or for the use of embankments for pulling boats or transshipment and or could resist river improvements. A pattern seems to have evolved. Prior to 1500, city corporations were given river development authority. For instance, the city of London started developing the River Thames in 1179. Later, the Crown gave development authority to local landowners who put forward specific development and toll schemes. The latter is of interest because it is part of the model carried over to the canal era. The river experience yielded the first institutional form for canals, while technological experience carried over. River development utilized dredging, flashboards, structures placed alongside the water to increase the amount of water that can be contained, and locks. Lock technology in particular could carry over directly as could some of the dredging technology. John Smeaton, later a famous canal engineer, obtained his first experience on river projects. The flashboard system required a good water supply and canals could not be so wasteful of water. Arthur describes the domain canal world as a watery world of barge horses and boatmen and locks and towpaths, which was fluid but slow. It had one functionality, the movement of bulk cargoes, but it had huge cost savings compared to alternative means to accomplish this task. Canal developments were considerable on any scale, but England did not lead West Europe. Building on Leonardo's invention of the mitre gate with sluices, France, the Low Countries, and North Italy were well served by networks of canals by the late 18th century. The Canal du Midi dates from 1666. The decision to adopt standards suited for Flemish boats was taken in 1810, and a general plan for the canalization of France was adopted in 1820. Another plan was developed and implemented in 1880 at a time when inland canals were largely obsolete. Building on the fringe of the feasible pressed for suitable technologies and some small tub canals were constructed. Commodities were moved in trained six-ton tubs. A horse could move each tub on a near-level tramway and they could be handled easily on inclines. An interesting classification of sources of funds for canal and river improvements is shown. Adding the tub canals, England had by about 1820 a four-level system of inland waterway improvements, the rivers and their improvements, broad canals extending river navigation, narrow 2.1 meter canals, and tub canals. James Brindley, fresh off the success of the Duke of Bridgewater's Canal, conceived of canals to link the four great rivers of England, the Mersey, Trent, Severn, and Thames, and a grand cross. He engineered the 150-kilometer Trent and Mersey Canal as the Grand Trunk Canal, 
and other canals quickly followed at the hands of other engineers like Thomas Telford. By the 1820s, the era of canal building in England was over. In part, the system was built out in that the feasible canals had been built and rail competition came along. Prior to the canal era, England's coastal and river trade took place using flat bottom sailing barges that could move 40 to 80 tons. The trade mainly centered on London. Coal, cattle, grain, building materials, and other commodities were moved to serve the needs of London. Rivers served collector distributor functions for trade routes across open seas. Though technological change was slow in both dock and barge technology, more docks and barges were constructed as the coastal trade grew. One point four Erie and Emulation Canals in the United States. Throughout the United States, settlers wanted access to transportation by means of river and canals and roads so they could bring their produce to market. In a nutshell, by eighteen hundred, the coast of Philadelphia and southward was well served by small ships and local trade, and numerous ports offered transatlantic services. The Connecticut and Hudson River served limited roles in New York and New England, and needs there pressed for early canal and road developments. Many early small canals were built, especially in New England. These were in the English organizational financing and technology style, and they used some English capital. Also, the opportunities to the west of Appalachia and in the interior south pressed for major long-distance open-up territory access improvements. King Cotton in the south benefited from downstream flows of the rivers, as bulky cotton floated downstream and finished goods could more easily be moved upstream. Although 1824 marked the beginning of continuing federal involvement in river improvements, early appropriations were modest and were mainly restricted to rivers regarded as of national importance. Debates about the federal role continued. The states and private interests were busy with canal and river works, and there was a rising tide of demands for federal appropriations. Avoiding conflict over specific projects, the federal government made land grants to the states for internal improvements, in the states and sometimes the federal government became stakeholders in projects by purchasing stock. Where the terrain was difficult and or water in short supply, inclined planes were constructed. The plane shown was constructed on the Pennsylvania Canal as part of the portage tramway across central Pennsylvania. The canal boats could be handled in sections, an unusual feature of this canal. A benchmark open territory event was the opening of the 580 kilometer long Erie Canal from Albany to on the Hudson to Lake Erie. Dubbed Clinton's Folly by skeptics in honor of project advocate New York City Mayor and later New York State Governor DeWitt Clinton, the Erie Canal was built with New York State support. The canal lowered costs and rates on shipments in order of magnitude, and it set off a clamor for similar investments. Due to success in 1835, 10 years after the Erie Canal opened, the New York legislature authorized an expansion that would increase the surface from 12 to 21 meters and the depth from 1.2 to 2.1 meters. This was completed in 1862. During the canal boom, three types of canals were constructed, connecting tidewater and upcountry crossing the Appalachians and connecting the Ohio River system with the Great Lakes. Many canals failed to recover enough funds to pay off capital. Some could not even pay operating costs. The decision of Pennsylvania to build a mainline canal from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh with some inclined railroads for the really steep bits along with a set of feeder canals was misguided. Topographically, Pennsylvania was far less suited than New York for canals, and as a consequence, the canal rose much higher and had many more locks than the competing Erie Canal. It also started later, and due to the feeder routes, was slower to build. While it carried traffic, it was not successful in the way the Erie Canal or later railroads were, despite being south of, and thus less frozen than, the Erie Canal. Pennsylvania sold much of the mainline canal system off to railroads, which were a much more suitable technology for crossing the Appalachians. Indiana's canals were among the worst systems. Some sections were only open for seven years before shutting, the better sections for only 20 years, and the revenue raised did not come close to repaying costs. States owned an even larger share of canals than turnpikes and raised much of the funds for those shareholdings through sales of bonds. The majority of government debt by the 1860s in many states was due to financing internal improvements like canals. The need for the additional state support for canals is in part due to their cost. Canals at 12,000 to 18,000 per kilometer were much more expensive enterprises than turnpikes at 3,000 to 6,000 per kilometer. Ra railroads were typically more expensive than canals. The New York Central came in at around 18,000 per kilometer. About 8.4 million people lived in the United States in 1815. 
comparable with the population of just the city of New York today. The economy was driven by agriculture and resource extraction. It was mostly local and rural, only 7.2% urban. Land transportation was difficult, much harder than by water, and the population hugged the coast in navigable waterways. Physical mobility was limited, but social mobility was to be strived for. In contrast with England, printer, that is publisher, John Niles noted that the U.S. possessed an almost universal ambition to get forward, while in England, once a journeyman weaver, always a journeyman weaver. New York attained long-term preeminence among U.S. East Coast ports in this era, displacing Boston and Philadelphia. Albion identifies four factors. Establishment of an attractive auction system for disposing of imports, organization of regular transatlantic packet service, development of the coastwise trade, building the Erie Canal. Baltimore was also fast growing during this period. Its merchants were able to consolidate local trade in the Chesapeake Bay region and open up to the west faster than rivals from Philadelphia, even before the landmark opening of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. It developed a clipper ship to enable fast sailing. A well-developed turnpike system also emerged around the city. The dominance of a few major cities, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore, kept secondary cities from growth. Salem, Albany, Providence, Richmond, and Norfolk were all subdued by larger neighbors that were able to achieve faster growth due to what are now called economies of agglomeration, first with economies of scale, then with specialization. Cities were dominated by trade and commerce, and the merchants who conducted it, wharves, warehouses, and stores characterized their physical appearance, and everything was tied together and directed from their nerve centers, the counting rooms, banks. The streets of every large city led down past the warehouses to the piers. From the farms, by river or road, came products for export, but this was the back country. In 1815, every city seemed to face the sea. Business was beginning to specialize, moving from a merchant controlling finance, retailing, and transport into separate specialist firms doing these things only. Instead of owning a ship, newer merchants would contract with common carriers. The inland waterway system meets the maritime transportation system discussed in Chapter 5. With a lag of several years while large projects got organized, canal spending by the states expanded rapidly in the 1830s, as did railroad construction. Reading the competitive situation and being displaced by government capital, spending by private canal companies decreased sharply. Committed to programs and projects, the public sector did not read the competitive situation. The state governments were slow to recognize the strong competition to be provided by railroads. Figure 1.6 shows the development pace in the U.S. One reason for the quick demise of canals was the unusually cold winters of the middle 1840s. There were short shipping seasons just at the time new canals were opening and facing competition from railroads. A so-called debt repudiation depression ran from 1839 to about 1847. The conventional reason given for that depression is the write down of investments made in canals and some changes in currency and banking policy. While not dismissing those factors, the depression also arose from the clash between the new and old technology and in particular to the displacements, the uses of the technology occasioned. Early railroads were at first adjuncts to canals and then competition for them. Tramways had long been used to move products of forest and mine short distances, and they fed traffic to canals. Some years after the development of the steam engine, steam replaced animal power on tramways. The locomotive was evolved and railroad deployment began competing first for passengers previously carried in carriages or on canals. Railroads next competed for commodities and began to expand beyond territories already served by canals. The above is a simple and well-known summary of canal development, but we should remember that it holds for only a small part of the world, particularly the eastern seaboard of the United States and portions of Western Europe. Most of the world did not share the history of road and canal building. Rather, the railroad was the mode that spread the commercial revolution, consolidated the control of central governments, and so on. This different beginnings is an important point is one of the reasons why the land transportation system in Japan differs from that in the United States, for example. Canals withered given competition with rail, some rapidly, some not. The Delaware and Lehigh Canal survived for some time. It was a mixed story for coastal transportation and inland waterway transportation, depending on topography and peculiarities of markets. The lack of bridges in the San Francisco Bay Area, for example, kept the scow, hauling hay, building materials, and so on, and ferry boats in business well into the 20th century. Coastal transportation of bulk materials continued, and Great Lakes freight movements increased. River-based waterway transportation withered quite a bit, 
to be reinvented later through barge technology. One point six discussion. We see an overriding question. The United States has to make up its mind about what it wants to do with its inland water resources. We told the Kentucky River and other stories to lay background for this point. River transportation was the name of the game in the early days, but today inland water transport is economically viable in only a few places. Large subsidies are required elsewhere. Yet the imprint of river transportation remains in the location of cities, old, unused, or little used dams, and then other physical remnants. The important thing is that river transport remains in the minds of those in the regions that once had those services. It's part of the culture and history. This sense of history, roots, role, or nostalgia has value, and perhaps it should be the main consideration in policy development. If we recognize that the subsidy for water transportation is not really for transportation, but rather to preserve the history of water transportation, then we can decide if the history is worthwhile. The modern modes owe much to canals. They demonstrate the payoffs from capital-intensive transportation improvements. On the hard technology side, they provided for the development of construction know-how. They also provided experience to manage, finance, and operate related institutions. This was learning by those who provide transportation. Railroad construction organizations derive from the canal experience. The public learned about investment opportunities and about off-system developments induced by transportation improvements. Canal learning provided experience toward generic policy for transportation and public works. Of course, canals have been around for a long time. We have not addressed learning by the English from other Europeans or learning by Europeans from the Chinese or the Egyptians. For instance, Pharaoh's Canal from 2000 to 610 BCE. Canals developed following the experience with toll roads. Unlike toll roads, large upfront capital for investment was required for canals. Also, canals usually required more engineering work. A style of engineering fiscal planning emerged and was engaged in by early civil engineers. Although a more complex matter, canals were organized and deployed much in the same way that precursor toll roads have been developed. Subject to constraints on the availability of water in suitable grades, canals tended to parallel thriving routes of commerce, as did the continuing development of coastal shipping. Although engineers of the times also worked on road plans, bridges, and harbors, the planning and construction of canals was their major activity. The discussion treated changes that took place during a period of population growth, economic development, and renewal and change in political institutions. On reflection, we are struck by how well the transportation development story unfolds with only minimal attention to these matters. Even more, we are struck by how the story unfolds with little reference to war and revolution and the great international political and economic changes taking place. The main conclusion from the discussion above is that experience was accumulated and embedded within the modes, know-how, rules, or policy, evolved bearing on organizations, pricing and management, and also on the use of hard technologies. With these exceptions, government actions were generally reactive. Even so, the notion emerged that government ought to be more active.